very much, Emily. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, talk a little bit about uh, air quality and lung health. And uh, so tonight's program is sponsored by the New Hampshire uh, Public Health Association um, and New Hampshire chapter of the Amer American Lung Association and Breathe New Hampshire. Uh, so our discussion tonight will be air quality, lung health, and asthma. And our speaker this evening is Laura Bender. Uh, Laura um, comes originally from California and she uh, is currently the uh, National Assistant Vice President for Healthy Air at the American Lung Association. Uh, she works and lives in the Washington DC area uh, where she directs a lot of advocacy initiatives, uh, works with Congress and a lot of uh, state health uh, agencies and medical organizations to uh, advance the cause of uh, healthy air quality uh, as it relates to public health and uh, 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 human rights as well. So uh, welcome, Laura, and uh, we look forward to your uh, talk, talk this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me. I'll say right at the top, it is so refreshing to be on a Zoom call where I can see the attendees as opposed to just speaking into the, the faceless void of a webinar. So looking forward to a great conversation tonight. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to have uh, to talk to you all. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Wish me luck. All right, I look okay? Looks good. Great. Um, so I'll take a few minutes to talk through, um, of course, air quality, lung health, and asthma. And in particular, um, I'm going to use that um, to talk about two recent lung association reports that I hope will be useful resources. We'll talk a bit about the health impacts of ozone, particle pollution, and climate change on health. And then we'll dive into some recommendations, both at the personal level and at the policy level. And Laura, just um, just to clarify for the other attendees, so if anybody has questions, if you could put those in the chat section, I will keep an eye on the chat section and then um, we can take questions at the end. Does that work for you, Laura? That sounds great. And I will aim to leave lots of good time for conversation at the end. So I will start off by introducing the Lung Association's State of the Air Report. Some of you may be familiar with this, but this is our annual air quality report. And our goal with it is to translate air quality data into everyday language to really put a human face um, and make this information accessible to the general public. Um, we keep it super local um, and we focus on two main pollutants and I'll talk more about them in a bit, particulate matter and ozone pollution. Um, and the way we do that is by giving grades and rankings to counties and to metro areas to really illustrate the levels of pollution that those areas are experiencing. Uh, another piece that um, I think is important with this report is that we really, again, try to put a human face on air pollution. Um, you all know, particularly if you see patients, that these stories can be really powerful. Um, we've actually integrated some personal stories throughout the report, um, and we've used that as a way to call for health equity, environmental justice, and drive people to be motivated to take action around the report. I'll talk um, for a minute about the health impacts um, of why the Lung Association cares about ozone and particle pollution. You know, we often say that someone in every family can be impacted when um, levels of ozone pollution or particle pollution are high. Um, but of course, some people are more vulnerable than others. Um, specifically looking at ozone and particle pollution, they have a lot of similar health impacts. So they can cause asthma attacks in people who have asthma. They can cause exacerbations in people who have COPD. Um, they can even cause wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath um, with people with no lung disease if the levels are high. Um, we also know that they're dangerous both in the short term and over time. Um, even long term exposure at lower levels can be harmful. Um, we know that it can, that both of them have cardiovascular impacts, can lead to heart attack and stroke. Um, there's emerging evidence that they lead to um, potentially cognitive disorders. There's particularly links between ozone and metabolic disorders. And then we also know that they um, are both linked with preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant mortality. The big difference between them that we often highlight is that particulate matter is also a carcinogen. The WHO has classified it um, as carcinogenic, and we know that um, it is linked to lung cancer. So to look at the report, and I'll direct everybody um, at your leisure to lung.org slash SOTA, where you can explore the report for yourself, because again, it is um, very localized, um, so you can look up your particular county. 
Um, this is a quick image of what the website looks like, but I'll dive into some key findings here. Um, once you get to the website, you can actually search by um, your zip code or by your state to get to the local data for your area. And now to dive into what we're actually grading. Um, so we are essentially translating data from the Environmental Protection Agency into, again, everyday language so that folks can understand the quality of the air that they're breathing. Um, we give A through F grades for days with unhealthy levels of ozone or particle pollution. Um, and we look at a three-year average in the report because we want, um, we want the results to be relatively stable year to year so that we can compare them. Um, and so this is what those A to F grades mean. Um, an A grade means that there were no days over the three-year period that we're looking at in the report where there were unhealthy levels of ozone or particle pollution. Um, and you can see it goes on down. The report also weights the days. So what just this is under the hood, but when we calculate the grades, we count really bad air days, you know, days that are worse on the air quality index, more than we count an orange day for air pollution. Just to illustrate the fact that some areas have um, higher levels of um, harmful air on their bad air days than others. Another big thing I'll note about the report, um, we get our data from EPA. So the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has official air quality monitors for ozone and particle pollution across the country, but they're not everywhere. And in fact, out of more than 3,200 counties in the U.S., only about 900 have monitors. Um, we advocate for more. We don't think this is enough, um, but this is the official air quality data from these two pollutants, so it's what we use. Um, that's why places, well, you know, places that don't have monitors will not have grades for their counties. Um, we also look at cities. Um, so we look at the metropolitan areas across the country and we rank them again for their levels of ozone and particle pollution. Um, and looking at the metro area really gives us a fuller picture because in a lot of places, you know, a given county might not have a monitor, but other counties in the metro do. And we all know that we live and move around within our metro areas. So what do we find? So, the Lung Association releases, has released this report for 23 years now. Um, and so we can really compare year to year. We found that in the state of the air 2022, nearly 9 million more people were impacted by spikes in particle pollution than in last year's report. To dive into that a bit, um, our report, as I mentioned, covers three years. This year's report is 2018, 19, and 20. It's a couple of years back because the um, EPA data takes some time to quality assure. And so we wanna make sure that it's right before we use it in the report. So um, what we found is that over that period, again, 2018 through 2020, there were nearly 9 million more people who lived in counties that got F grades for their spikes in particulate matter. We also found that there were more days when the air was either very unhealthy or hazardous. So the worst, you know, the purple and maroon levels, the worst um, levels in the air quality index than, ever we, than we've ever seen in the history of doing the report. And we'll talk more about where that comes from in a moment. Um, overall, there are 137 million people living in counties that got Fs for their levels of ozone or particle pollution. Um, and I'll talk more about this in a second, but we also show that, of course, as we all know, the burden of living with polluted air is not shared equally. People of color are more likely to live in places with unhealthy levels of ozone or particles. So again, here's a quick graphic um, that 137 million people translates to more than four in 10 Americans live in places with unhealthy levels of ozone or particle pollution. And then again, we found that people of color are more likely to live with the air is polluted. So they're about 1.6 times as likely to live in a place that gets at least one F and people of color are 3.6 times more likely than white people to live in a, country, a county that gets three failing grades. We grade three different measures. Um, and so this is the proportional, the disproportionate impact that we see in the report. So to dive into that particulate matter finding, um, you know, we haven't had to deal with this quite so much on the East Coast, but we're not unaffected, but this is really being driven by wildfire. Um, we saw just enormous spikes in particulate matter, particularly in Western cities as a result, you know, tied to the wildfires that were, took place in the years covered by this report. And in many cases, a lot of Western cities saw some of their worst days on record in terms of particle pollution levels. Um, and this is an illustration of what I mentioned earlier, that we saw more days of maroon or purple days um, those very unhealthy and hazardous levels in this year's report than we ever have before. 
So this is just shows the trend in days when we're reaching those really harmful levels somewhere in the country of particulate matter. Um, so I mentioned we grade three measures. This is the, these are the short-term spikes in particulate matter. So these are the most polluted cities for that measure. Um, you will notice a very heavy weight toward the West Coast. We also look at the day in, day out levels of year round particle pollution, um, because again, you know, the, the pollutants are, that we cover are dangerous, especially particle pollution in both short term spikes and if you're exposed chronically to even lower levels. Um, this was more mixed. The, the report results this year were much worse for short term PM. The year on particulate matter was, you know, some cities did a little worse, some cities did a little bit better. Um, the good news here is that Pittsburgh and Detroit. Um, long time having um, elevated levels of this pollutant uh, achieve their lowest levels ever. Here's the quick list of the most polluted cities for this, uh, this pollutant. Again, very Western. And then finally, ozone. So we also, in addition to those two different measures for particle pollution, we also look at ozone. Um, this tends to be you know, the most widespread of the air pollutants. This, again, the story here was a little mixed. Um, we saw that there were um, more cities among the most polluted improving than not improving, which is great. Um, we're still at a place where three, um, three out of 10 Americans, or excuse me, three out of eight Americans live in places with S grades for their ozone, so we're certainly not where we need to be. Um, but at least we weren't seeing record-breaking ozone levels in this year's report. Again, here's the most polluted list. I sound like a broken record, but again, you'll notice that the west, western half of the country in this case really dominates this list. Um, Los Angeles has been at the top of the most polluted for ozone list, I think for all but, the, all but one year in the 20 year history of this report. Um, to get on the cleanest cities list, we have cleanest cities for each pollutant, um, but the cleanest cities here not only got A grades for their levels of ozone and particles, but they were also among the lowest for their year round levels. Um, this is a distinctly less Western list. Um, it's a good mix of cities sort of up and down the Eastern half of the country. And then I put this up here. These are all the New Hampshire counties at once. Again, I highly encourage folks to go to lung.org slash SOTA um, at your leisure to, um, to dig in a little bit more, but I wanted to just put these up on the screen. Um, a couple of things about what the report results include. So number one, I mentioned we have three measures. Um, the spikes in ozone and particle pollution are A through F. The annual level is actually a pass fail. Um, the report also includes estimates of the county by county populations who are at greater risk of health impacts from um, ozone and particle pollution. So up here as an example, I put the estimated population totals for pediatric and adult asthma. We also include COPD totals, new lung cancer cases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and then new this year, we also include pregnancies because um, as we talked about earlier, there um, are definitely health impacts to pregnancies and to, to fetuses and to newborns of air pollution. I'll just leave this up for a minute so folks can see um, what, how your county did. And you'll notice that there are a couple that say DNC, that's did not collect, that is those places that don't have monitors in the county. Now, one other thing I want to point out, and again, you can see this in more detail on the website, but I think this is a good illustration of a trend we see nationwide. So here's just one county in New Hampshire. Um, the report on the website also includes trend charts. Um, and this type of graph is really similar to the trend charts we see in most of the country when it comes to ozone pollution, which is, as you can see, a huge success story. Um, you know, the, the peaks earlier in the, you know, in the early 2000s or late 90s um, have come down, thanks in part to measures that the nation has taken to clean up the sources that um, contribute to ozone pollution. Um, However, the caveat there is that, of course, number one, as a country, we're not there yet. And number two, climate change is beginning to undo some of that progress. So I'll say more about what I mean with that. Um, I mentioned that, um, and we'll see more graphs on this in a second, the air pollution burden is largely centered on the West Coast or the Western half of the country in this year's report. Um, that is obviously not good news for the West Coast. 
but it does actually show that a lot of the cleanup measures um, that have driven down emissions from industrial sources, power plants, vehicles, have really cleaned up pollution in many um, parts of the eastern half of the country. Thanks to the Federal Clean Air Act and the measures that have been implemented with it, we've seen cars get significantly cleaner, um, trucks and, and vehicles are all less polluting, there are emissions controls in place where there didn't used to be, many of the oldest emission sources have been shut down or replaced with cleaner ones, um, and that's all helping to drive that trend chart that I showed on the previous slide of significant progress. Um, however, um, climate change, as we see in this report, is actually beginning to undo much of that progress. Um, it's doing that in a couple ways. So one, you know, there are a myriad of health impacts to climate change. Um, you all <laughs> do a better job articulating them than I. Um, the two I'll focus here are on ozone and particle pollution. Um, so first off, ozone. Um, ozone is not formed directly from polluting sources. Instead, it's formed when emissions from vehicles, power plants, industry, even some chemicals um, react in the presence of heat and sunlight. Um, more heat tends to mean more ozone pollution, and so warmer temperatures driven by climate change are coinciding with upticks in ozone levels. It's making ozone harder to clean up in much of the country. Um, there were parts of the country that, that showed up a bit in this report. Um, thankfully, the years that this report covered weren't as hot as some previous years, um, so we didn't see that trend necessarily show up nationwide in this report, um, but certainly in, for example, Southern California, we saw some levels that um, you know, we're consistent with the hotter days. And then of course, wildfires. We all know that climate change is enhancing the conditions for wildfires. Wildfire season is longer, it's more dangerous, the wildfires are more catastrophic, um, and they're producing smoke that sometimes reaches us here in the East. Um, and this is really where we're seeing the impacts of climate change in this year's report, is in those wildfire numbers. You know, of course, we can't say that any given wildfire is you know, caused or not caused by climate change. It's about enhancing the overall conditions for wildfires to form. And we're clearly seeing that, you know, consistently with the predictions of the impacts of climate change, we're seeing those increases in wildfire and we're seeing the increased exposure to wildfire smoke in this year's report. You know, it's a pretty profound illustration that those trend charts after, you know, decades of progress under the Clean Air Act are beginning to tick back upward. We're seeing that in many parts of the country. Um, and then that's also showing, as I mentioned a minute ago, that there is this growing disparity um, between the two halves of the country in terms of their air quality. Hopefully these, these are supposed to animate. Let's see if it works. There we go. Um, so this is a quick illustration that we put together um, to show the extent to which the air pollution burden has shifted over time. Um, so this one is for short-term particle pollution. Um, so you can see it'll cycle between um, 2007 and now, and you can see that over time um, that what used to be a fairly equally distributed burden um, has shifted westward. Um, the same goes for the annual particle pollution. Um, so again, those blue dots um, are places that are passing that pass-fill grade. The reds are the ones that are failing it. Um, you can see that we have gone from a fairly distributed problem to one that's concentrated in, largely in California. And then finally, here's ozone. Again, we started off in 2007 with a, a lot of red nationwide. So I think this one both shows the trend, but also the nationwide progress that we've made in cleaning up this pollutant. But you can see that when we when it cycles back um, to present, um, again, the problem is concentrated in the West. The question we get a lot about this year's report is what about COVID? Um, this is the first report to cover 2020, when of course many of us, um, well, I'm talking to a healthcare provider, so many of us, speaking being me, had the luxury of working from home during the pandemic. Um, which um, you know, many of us were fortunate enough to be able to do meant that we were driving less. Um, so we were wondering as we looked at the results this year, you know, would we see reduced air pollution um, coinciding with the, with the timing of the lockdowns? The answer is no, not really, not overall for a couple of reasons. Um, so one, I think that the fact that the report covers that broad three-year period, it's you know, deliberately designed to make sure that there aren't aberrations that throw off the results in the comparison year to year. So it is still showing an overall three-year average of levels, and that's intentional. So that mitigates the impact of, um, you know, of the stay-at-home orders. 
But I think the other thing here I'll say is that we actually um, saw upticks in air pollution in some places that are close to warehouses and distribution centers. Um, you know, we all started ordering a lot of stuff, understandably, when we couldn't go out to buy it. Um, and, you know, it's it looks like the uptick in online shopping and delivery um, is actually leading to higher levels for people that happen to live near, you know, warehouses, ports, other places where there's a lot of either port traffic or vehicle traffic um, delivering goods. Um, and so that we, you know, we flag this as actually a, an evolving issue in our report is an emerging impact of error, um, you know, an emerging thing to keep an eye on in terms of air pollution, because of course, you know, not only does that offset some of the gains that we could have had during the pandemic as a sort of a silver lining, but it also is really disproportionate, of course, in who tends to live, you know, near poor communities or warehouses or distribution centers that tends to be either communities of color or lower income communities. So what are we asking for? So our central advocacy message of this year's report is to call on the Biden administration to strengthen the national limits on particle pollution. Um, essentially, in part of implementing and enforcing the Clean Air Act, there are national limits on both ozone and particulate matter. Those are the same limits that have really helped drive a lot of the progress that we've seen over the course of this report. Um, one of the great things about the Clean Air Act is that these limits by law have to be based on what the health science says is necessary. They are not based on what industry says it will cost to clean up emission sources. They're not based um, on anything except the health science. And so EPA, the US Environmental Protection Agency, has the task of every five years periodically reviewing the health science, asking the question, do the national limits still match what the science shows is necessary? And then updating them if necessary. Um, and what we found over the several um, rounds that these standards have been in place is that the, the science has generally shown that these pollutants are more dangerous in smaller concentrations and in more ways than was previously realized. The more we dig into these emissions and the health science, the worse they tend to look. Um, and so we have typically, in each of these reviews, seen EPA strengthen the standards. Um, the time has come for them to do that again, as the current standards are out of date. The national limits on particulate matter, um, they're much stronger than they used to be, which is good, but they are still short of what the health science shows would be truly protective. Um, and that matters for two reasons. One, it's, you know, it's the level that communities across the country will then have to meet. So it's, a, it's critical that we drive clean up measures to what the actual amount that's safe to breathe is. Um, and then two, when people use something like the air quality index to look at their daily air quality, that's based on the standards. So if the standards are outdated, they're not quite getting the full picture of levels that may put their health at risk. So I will make my quick pitch to you now um, in your personal capacities. Um, if you choose to, we would welcome you signing our petition to EPA asking them to follow the health science and set stronger particulate matter standards. Now, what I'll do next, I'll talk through a few of the policy, personal and policy recommendations in the report and then I'll actually, in case you're not tired of long association reports yet, I'll also at the end bring in another report that we just released that is also very solution focused. Um, so in this year's state of the air, we include, again, recommendations for personal action and policy change. Um, for individuals, of course, we advise people to check their air quality forecasts. State of the air is great. We really want it to be a resource for people. We wanted them to use it to get a sense of what the air quality looks like in their area, but of course does not give them day-to-day -day information. So we continue to send people to airnow.gov to check their daily air quality, look at the forecasts, and then, you know, of course, a lot of the people the Lung Association serves are those that need to take protective measures if the air quality is forecast to be poor. Um, you know, kids that might skip, skip afternoon soccer practice if the ozone levels will be high, or families that may need to follow wildfire um, pollution measures um, if, the, if it looks like there's a smoke event happening in their area. Um, to that point, we also have resources at lung.org slash wildfire that people can use to, um, to put in place measures in their own homes to keep smoke out. Um, and then we know, you know, from people, from feedback to the Lung Association, we know that people are eager for ways that they can contribute to clean air in their personal lives. So we actually have a stand up for clean air initiative, lung.org slash air, that connects people with tips that they can use in their own life to reduce their contributions to air pollution and climate change. Of course, that said, that is um, what we really need is policy change at every level of government. And this is both to clean up the sources of emissions that contribute to ozone and particle pollution levels that harm people, and of course, to address climate change. 
Um, so we split our recommendations up between local, um, state, ter territorial, and tribal, and national. At the local government level, we call on um, the communities to adopt climate action plans, um, particularly that include the health impacts of climate change in their action plans. Um, for city fleets or county fleets, purchase zero emission vehicles. Um, and then to the extent they can, get their power from renewable non-combustion sources. Um, the Lung Association uh, does, uh, supports, you know, obviously clean electricity or clean energy would be catchier. We always qualify by saying renewable non-combustion. Um, we, our, our unofficial moniker for our, what we want out of energy policy is don't burn stuff. Um, we would like our energy to come from truly clean sources that don't have emissions. So again, at the state, territorial, territorial and tribal level, we've called on governments to set clean electricity standards, um, you know, or one of the many names they go by, um, you know, renewable portfolio standards, clean peak standards, um, but, you know, set a set an aggressive target for how much of that energy needs to come from clean renewable sources. Again, we push for those sources to be non-combustion, so not based on burning. Um, we know we need more investment in air quality monitoring, <clears throat> um, excuse me, not just for, you know, this report to be more robust and to have better data on ozone and air quality, or particulate matter air quality, but also because additional air monitoring can help identify hotspots where there are communities being disproportionately exposed to emissions. And then our third recommendation at the state level is that states adopt California's vehicle standards. Under the Clean Air Act, California has the abil ability to set stronger pollution standards for its vehicles than the federal governments, um, and states have the option to opt into them. So states can actually choose to follow the more protective light and heavy duty vehicle standards that California is adopting. And then the federal government. Um, so I already mentioned particulate matter. Um, EPA is also doing the same process for ozone. So we're calling them on not only to strengthen the standard for particulate matter to drive cleanup nationwide, but also for ozone. Um, we're calling on Congress to pass climate investments as I imagine many of you are. Um, of course, you know, we need protections from EPA, but we also need investments from Congress um, to really drive a nationwide transition away from polluting sources. Um, and then again, um, in terms of federal standards to really drive a transition to zero emission vehicles. And that brings me to my quick um, final note on our other recent report. Um, so the Lung Association, right before we put out State of the Air, put out a report called Zeroing In on Healthy Air. It's available at lung.org slash EV. And we worked with a consulting firm to model. We asked ourselves the question, what would the health benefits be if we had 100% sales of zero emission vehicles and 100% clean non-combustion renewable electricity? Um, so these are the targets that we use. We said, all right, let's set an aggressive but achievable target. Let's say we get to... Um, all new vehicles being sold are zero emission um, on the car side by 2035, for vans, trucks, and buses by 2040. And then we meet what the Biden administration has laid out as their goal um, for clean electricity by 2035. And here's what we found. Um, so over 30 years, that would lead to $1.2 trillion in public health benefits. So that's a combination of avoided health impacts and avoided premature deaths. That's a total of 110,000 premature deaths avoided nationwide, 2.7 million asthma attacks avoided, and 13.4 million lost workdays avoided. The benefits are clearly enormous. We also looked at the global climate benefits um, because this public health impact is actually, doesn't even take into account the long-term health implications of climate change. That's just the impacts from the ozone particulate matter and other emissions that are formed as a result of the vehicles and the electricity. Um, the total climate benefits would be another $1.7 trillion. Um, the report also includes state-by-state state information. Um, and so we actually modeled out the, um, these same numbers um, for state-by-state. State. So the top line here is that New Hampshire would see $3.9 billion in health benefits as a result of this transition. You know, again, we designed this to be ambitious but achievable, and we're using it to, you know, really as a proof point in our advocacy to say that you know, in order to address the climate crisis, but also to protect health, we really need to be making the switch to zero emission. I mentioned we don't like burning stuff. Um, that includes vehicles as well as our power plants. And so, you know, really by getting to our goals of zero emission vehicles on the road, whether they're trucks, buses, or passenger cars, and non-combustion renewable electricity, 
we need to do both in tandem if we're going to see these health benefits. It's really a multiplier because, of course, you know, switching to zero emission vehicles that are plugged into electricity powered by a dirty source, that doesn't get you the full health benefit. Naturally, that report also includes policy recommendations um, that will likely um, look familiar. Um, in fact, these are um, largely echoed in state of the air, but again, really adopting those stronger standards that California has um, to commit to um, higher and higher percentages of sales of new vehicles being zero emission, and then getting climate investments and stronger standards across the finish line at the federal level. Um, again, I really hope that I want to make these reports a resource for you. Um, and so I'll say, we'll, of course, we'll go into the Q&A in just a minute. But I do want to say, you know, you should always feel free to reach out to me as you're digging in. Um, we really, you know, we aim for these both to be localizable. So there's information at the state level for the zeroing out and healthy air report and at the county and metro area level for the state of the air report. Um, I'll finally say that State of the Air um, is coming up on its 25th anniversary, and in conjunction with that, we want to take a look at the methodology and figure out how we can make it as useful as possible. So we are always open to your feedback, but more so than ever, as we're, you know, hoping to map out a plan to make some changes, um, definitely let me know as, as you're looking at these, how they could be the most useful that they could be to you in illustrating the health benefits of um, people monitoring their air quality and then the nation switching to cleaner sources that don't add to the pollution burden. All right, with that, um, I will turn it back over to you, Rick, to moderate our Q&A. Sure, Laura, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting presentation. As I was listening to you speak, like just a kind of like a running list of questions in my own mind that I go through, I don't want to commandeer the entire discussion, but I did uh, want to make a couple comments. Um, you know, one is just in terms of the impact of this, of air quality on health, a um, couple things. When I was in medical school, I went to Columbia, New York City, and one of my first exposures to this issue um, was in Harlem, where we, uh, I did my pediatric uh, rotation as a medical student, and um, this was a big issue back then in the 1990s. Um, correlating uh, air quality with um, the uh, prevalence or incidence of asthma and asthma control going on in Harlem. This was a big problem uh, in that community. So that was one of my first exposures to it. The second is that in, in my career now, um, you know, the air quality and whether it's good or bad has a major daily impact uh, on the lives of patients with uh, chronic lung disease, uh, to the extent that a lot of my patients that have COPD as an example, but including other conditions as well, pulmonary fibrosis, asthma, others, um, these folks are very in tune to what the air quality is outside. And a lot of them are very impacted in terms of their quality of life based on what's going on outside and that they, they spend more time indoors, more time isolated, the more bad air quality days that they are exposed to. So this is a real issue. Um, and New Hampshire itself, you know, uh, way back when, you know, a lot of the communities in the northern parts of the state in the wet, White Mountains were havens for people to come from the cities in the summertime to enjoy a better air quality um, and to uh, manage some of these long-term conditions for which we didn't have good treatments, you know, 100 years ago, which is kind of interesting. Um, I just wanted, I had one question um, as you were uh, showing us some of the states, uh, California, Alaska, um, Arizona, that had particularly bad air quality grades. And what was interesting to me is what, what do states like California, Alaska, and Arizona have in common in terms of what drives their air quality? I mean, clearly they're in the Western part of the country um, but is there, are there other elements to those states that, that, that impact their air quality? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So they are all impacted by wildfire smoke. So particularly when it comes to the particulate matter levels, we really did see that show up in all three places. Um, but there are some differences. So Alaska also has um, high levels of particulate matter driven in part by wood stove use. I imagine an issue not unfamiliar to all of you. Um, Arizona um, and other parts of the Southwest, Utah included, also have some unique geography that can um, lead to, for example, wintertime ozone problems. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the geography of California leading to its, its thick fog of pollution um, is infamous. But, you know, 
we always mention that our report grades uh, air quality, but not local efforts to clean it up. Of course, a lot of the places that have some of the most polluted air have also made the most progress in getting it better than it used to be. Sure. So we we actually have, a I think, a small enough group that if, if I, I have been monitoring the chat, there are a few questions there. Um, I'll go in order, but I'll uh, have each person, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask uh, your own question uh, directly to Laura. So the first question I have is from uh, Semra Atour. Uh, Semra, if you want to unmute yourself, you, you can go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Thank you, Laura. This was a really wonderful presentation. And one of the things that I wish we had in New Hampshire is more granular data below the county level, because most of our policy making is at the sub county town level in New England, particularly in New Hampshire. And I work on a lot of environmental justice issues. We just cannot get the data that we need. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or thoughts or just words of encouragement because it's been a frustration for so long and we wish we could get the data that New York has, but we just can't. Yeah, I definitely have words of encouragement. Um, you know, it's it's true that the state of the air does not have that local granular data. And to your point, a lot of times, you know, pollution is a problem neighborhood to neighborhood. And so a community might look great in the aggregate, but it's not capturing every emission. It's also only covering ozone and particle pollution. So if you are experiencing the brunt of air toxics, for instance, it won't show up in the report. So yeah, it's it's definitely imperfect. I think a couple of things. One, this is not directly relevant to New Hampshire yet, I don't think, but I have seen EPA doing more and more with personal air monitors um, or air sensors. So there's actually, if folks haven't explored it yet, there's a version of the air quality index um, forecast available at airnow.gov through a link that specifically uses purple air monitors and wildfire data together. Because I think what EPA you know, was acknowledging is that if you live in a wildfire prone area, the daily, the general daily forecast is not helpful enough. What you need to know is in the next hour, can I walk my dog? Is there going to be enough of a gap in the smoke for me to go outside relatively safely compared to later this afternoon? And so I think those personal, you know, those low cost sensors do present an opportunity. Obviously, you know, they're not quality assured in the same way that other types of data are, but I think the fact that EPA is incorporating them is, could be really helpful um, for their use. Um, also, as a side note, again, don't know that it's directly relevant to New Hampshire, but NASA also looks at air quality from its satellites. Um, so places that don't have local monitors, there may actually be satellite data. Um, oh, great. I'll, I have friends, believe it or not, at NASA. I could ask them. We have a NASA Earth Space Grant Institution, so I'll, I will ask them. I never thought of that. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, again, there's actually a division, I can drop in the link, um, but there's actually a division that looks at how to make their data applicable. So um, there could be more done there. And then finally, this is something that we actually saw Congress acknowledge um, with the infrastructure law. We definitely need more investment in air quality monitoring, but there was some money for communities to do enhancing air quality monitoring. I think acknowledging that, you know, for people to meet their for the White House to meet its commitments on environmental justice, for people to, um, you know, demonstrate the problems in their communities so that it can get cleaned up, um, that we need more investment there. So I will, I don't have an immediate update on what's happening with that, but it's on my list to get one. So <laughs> I'm happy to share that after the fact to see if there are new pathways as a result of that law. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, Bob, you had a couple of questions on the chat as well. Do you want to uh, unmute and, and uh, go over your couple of questions there? Sure. Thanks, Laura, for that excellent presentation. Uh, some of what I had in mind, you'd already answered in, in um, responding to Semra's questions. But I wondered if you have any specific data on rural versus urban communities and the nature of air pollution, you know, specific to rural communities like we have in New Hampshire. Good question. Um, not broadly. I think part of the challenge here is that, you know, really the, the way that air quality monitors are placed, the ones that we use in this report, EPA is using its limited dollars to give to give to states to maintain the monitors in a way that captures the most population. And what that often means is that it's the rural communities that don't have monitors at all. What we have found, and again, less specific New Hampshire, um, we do have rural places in parts of the country where there's a lot of oil and gas activity. 
that have elevated ozone levels, likely as, as a result of the VOCs and other emissions from the oil and gas drilling. Um, you know, when they're nowhere near a metro that would have a sizable chunk of cars or other industries. So I think that would be the issue that comes to mind first is that we do see ozone problems in places that, you know, you might not have expected absent the oil and gas drilling industry. Okay, I think, thanks. And, and also you're not looking, or do any of your studies look at indoor air quality? And are you looking at- state of the air. Um, but I'm happy to speak to that separately if it's helpful because we do, Lung Association certainly does have air, indoor air resources and are actually working on some more. So just wondering how those findings correlate with the outdoor air quality findings. Yeah, so we haven't looked at, you know, we haven't necessarily put monitors in, you know, indoors in places that are getting Fs outdoors to see what the correlation is. Um, we are actually working now on a research review looking at the health impacts of indoor combustion. So appliances, um, you know, whether, uh, you know, gas, oil, wood, um, to see what we find there, including the question of, you know, what do we know about the, the contribution from indoor to outdoor? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think, you know, not to harp on wildfires, but I think, you know, it is very, a lot of our our resources are now focusing, you know, in terms of how to get patients the help they need are focusing on, you know, how do you keep the outdoor air out? You know, there's, there's a lot of, I will say confusion, at least on the patient side around what they can, you know, what devices they can buy um, to clean their air quality indoors. I think obviously all of us know that the proliferation of devices promising to clean your air of viruses is um, <laughs> very widespread. Um, and, you know, the same the same measures don't necessarily work on ozone and on particles indoors. Um, some cleaning methods produce ozone, which obviously we're not in favor of. So, you know, there's lots of guidance that we have around it, but we really have, you know, had we have shifted or focused in a lot of our communications to patients around, you know, how to use them properly if they're gonna if they're living in a place with high levels of pollution. Okay, great. Um, so Laura, one of the uh, things that I was thinking about as, as you were talking, and this is something that I spend some time discussing as a, as a pulmonologist with my colleagues sort of informally in the hallway. And I say, you know, I was watching a documentary. Um, I'm not even sure what it was on, but it was, it was old footage of, of cities like in the 1800s. And it, I think it was talking about, you know, food quality and, and monitoring food safety. And they were showing these old black and white photographs of people just basically carrying these, you know, buckets of milk, like right from a cow in the middle of the summer. You, you bought it in these free open air markets and there was no regulation and nobody knew whether it was safe or not. And nobody really even cared, to be honest. And that, as these people are carrying these buckets of milk down the street, you know, there's open gutters, there's horses, there's all the stuff associated with horses and the manure all over the place. And you know, nowadays we, we take it for granted that we take very seriously the, the, the uh, cleanliness and quality of our water, our food supply, sanitation. And I've said that if there's one silver lining in COVID, it's that maybe the next kind of level is to really for people to key in on, well, what's the quality of the air that I breathe, whether it's indoors or outdoors, um, what's in that air, what's not in it, you know, how fresh is it? Um, is it going to make me sick or not? How likely? How do I know um, that maybe 100 years from now, we'll look back and we'll say, my God, we all lived blind, just kind of going about our day, breathing whatever air was in front of us without even thinking uh, for a moment about what, what's, what's in it or not, not in it. Um, so that would be, you know, my aspiration, maybe many years down the line is that we, we have a much better understanding of what's in our air. And, and this is obviously important work uh, in that direction. Yeah, I'm happy to just respond quickly and say, you know, I think the the silver lining of the, you know, the uptick in ozone as well as and, and particle pollution that we've seen in the last few years or years of reports is that people get it. You know, it's the same as the climate impacts more broadly, right? Like we have we all as advocates have to do less and less to connect the dots for people because it's more and more likely that they will have lived through an impact of climate change and seen it with, you know, with their own eyes. And so my hope is that, yes, there will be, you know, it'll, it'll hopefully in the future, it will be hard to imagine a time when, you know, we didn't have national limits on carbon pollution, for example. 
What are some of the things that you I was struck by one of the graphs that you showed of like in New Hampshire about the decline in ozone pollution is sort of like a success story that, you know, back in the, you know, 1980s, 90s, things were really bad and then they got better. What, what were, um, what, what kinds of things made that get better? I think a great example is how much cleaner our cars have gotten. Um, you know, the, the use of catalytic converters, for example, um, in, you know, newer vehicles are successively cleaner and cleaner. You know, we, we all can attest to it, right? We get better and better gas mileage, um, but they're also less and less polluting. And, you know, I think if you compare the U.S. to overseas, this is a really good example of the success of the Clean Air Act. You know, our air pollution levels are actually quite good for similar countries. Um, in many of those countries, they're experiencing much higher levels of traffic pollution. You know, they're still largely using diesel. The, you know, the emissions requirements, you know, historically have been less strong. And so we have really driven down um, a big chunk of air pollution by getting cleaner cars and trucks on the road. Yeah, that's a great point. I see Bob Dewey, you have a question. Yes, thank you, Laura. This has been a terrific talk. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I, I am one of the people in our group that goes on the road and gives uh, climate and health talks to lay groups predominantly. And I spend, spend a lot of mornings at Rotary Club meetings and things like that. And I, you know, I, I paint a, uh, I try to paint a really scary picture, particularly of particulate matter. Um, you know, with you know, diagrams of going across the capillary membrane and getting into the brain and, you know, some data about people who live in high risk areas are like that. But then I'm speaking to a lot of, you know, probably upper class white people who basically come back and they make the same argument to me that you just made. We have and I show the benefits, the health benefits from the Clean Air Act back in 1970. It's just remarkable the progress that was made just with that. And and these these you know people kind of roll their eyes at me and say, "Man, we have more cars than ever on the road, and the particulates lower than ever." And I get a lot of pushback um, from these guys. And I I you know I try to talk about the high risk areas and the high risk populations and climate justice and all that stuff. But beyond that, what, what would you recommend? What would you say to those folks? Depends. It's a great question. I welcome other responses from the group too, because I'd love to learn from your experiences. I think a few paths you could go, you know, I think if it's, if it's the right crowd for it, highlighting the potential impacts of climate change, you know, we have all this progress, let's not undo it. There are these things that are coming down the pike that could undo a lot of the work that we've done and put our kids at risk. Um, you know, we know, we all collectively know that people care most about climate when it's connected to their health or their family's health. Um, I think also, you know, some of the specific impacts that I find most frightening are those around maternal health. So, you know, reproductive developmental harm, and we can present that as new research, right? Because, you know, it's great that we've made this progress, but oh God, we now have all these new studies, you know, recently out that show that there are these, you know, that particle pollution is causing infant mortality. What a staggering impact that, you know, we have the opportunity to further cut down on. And then I think finally, you know, I, I struggle to be solutions focused, right? We're in a grim business. <laughs> um, but I think presenting, you know, the public health and economic benefits as a win-win, right? Like it's not That's that we're trying, trying to, to do. Yeah. Right, exactly. We're not trying to impose more onerous restrictions. We're trying to say great news. There are sources of pollution er, pollution-free sources of energy and transportation. They're great for us. You know, they can address climate change and cut air pollution at the same time. You know, feel free to use our EV report as, or the zero and unhealthy air report as a proof point. Um, and, you know, maybe it's about a community level vision, right? A, you know, a more sustainable community with the things they like, walkable stores and access to parks, you know, part of a, a broader vision of the benefit that they could see. But I, I definitely welcome other thoughts here too. Yeah, one, one thing I always say at that point too, is I, I talk about, you know, the kids going through the, the school bus zone in the, you know, after school, the elementary kids with those tender young lungs, you know, trying to find their bus, uh, sucking in all that uh, diesel particulate. Uh, so that's just one example I try to give to folks as well, but. Um, yeah, and then, you know. But, but, but it is a huge success story already, that's for sure. Anyway, thank you very much for this evening. I appreciate the question. 
And uh, Samara, you had another uh, comment. Sorry, I just, I think that there's some epigenetic research. I'll see if I can find some links. So that would show that, you know, even potential in utero transmission and things within the genome that are potentially being affected. So I'll see if I can find that. I think there's some new research on that. Rick, if I could, Lois has her hand up as well. Would you like to make a comment? Thank you. And thank you, Laura. Uh, so helpful and informative. I'm a lay person. I'm not medically trained or educated. So it was great. Thank you. I'm also very appreciative of the um, fact that there's a petition out there that we can sign. And my question to you is really kind of along the petition line. Um, there is a court, at least one case going forward before the Supreme Court. It's coming up to um, you probably know what I'm going to say, right? That, that Go ahead. they're trying to find the the EPA on the EPA's authority to set standards and and uh, enforce them unconstitutional, thereby taking that power away and and abolishing basically what we're doing. And I was wondering if uh, the Lung Association has an amicus brief. I think it's a very powerful, I hate to quote, it's not in front of me right now, it might be like, you know, Koch brothers level power going up with this thing. And given Citizens United outcome, voting rights outcome, it is really scary that this is coming. Wondered what is happening to try to reinforce how critical to our lives air and water and soil are. It's a and great and protections. Thanks. Yeah, great and alarming question. So I actually, we are actually involved in the case. So we, the Lung Association was, yes, we, we, we do get involved in lawsuits. Um, I like to point out to folks that we are a nonpartisan organization and we sue administrations of both political stripes to get better air protections in place. Um, but yes, yeah, so we actually, we um, led the suit well, our pro bono counsel of the suit, but our name led the suit um, opposing EPA's affordable clean energy rule, the bad Trump administration replacement to the clean power plan. Um, that got consolidated into the case that the Supreme Court is now hearing. Um, and yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it is scary, right? Like I don't, there are, there are definitely some potential outcomes of this case that could seriously curtail EPA's ability to, you know, set wide scale standards that regulate greenhouse gases from the power sector. I think, you know, obviously we won't know the implications until it's out, I think probably next month, but I will say that there are some really bedrock bread and butter um, air standards in the law that have passed muster with the Supreme Court. So the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, the one that the petition is on, um, there was a 9-0 Supreme Court, Court opinion um, that upheld that those standards have to be based on health, not anything else. So, you know, nothing is certain. Obviously, this is a scary Supreme Court for people that <laughs> favor government regulations that protect public health. Um, but there is a lot of really strong history. And again, you know, not just bipartisan support, but Supreme Court, um, what's the word I want, uh, you know, upholding the protection, some of the protections that are in place under the Clean Air Act. Right. Thank you so much. Is there anything we as an organization and organizations like us can do to further um, buttress the, the need for those standards never to go away? Yeah, I think, you know, we are thinking through now what we do from a, you know, a messaging and public, you know, hopefully not outcry response perspective when the opinion does come out on that case again, likely next month. I think, you know, whatever it is, using it as a moment to highlight the need in the media um, among, you know, and in your own communities is critical. I think also, you know, it is always, I saw one of the questions in the chat, um, you know, who are we, what's our opposition? Who are we up against? Um, particularly when it comes to setting stronger ozone and particulate matter standards, there is all, it is always contentious. And, you know, I'll be very frank, although EPA makes a credible case to follow the science, they rarely set the level of the as protective as we want it. Um, and that's because obviously we are not the only ones weighing in. They're hearing from, you know, a lot of times local government officials who are worried about the cost of their communities. Um, they're, 
you know, beset by the American Petroleum Institute or the National Association of Manufacturers, you know, using scare tactics about how we can't possibly afford to meet these new regulations, even though we always do. Um, so I think that particularly around the issue of the setting stronger ozone and particle pollution standards, hearing from community leaders is helpful for the administration, um, whether it's community organizations saying, hey, this would be good for my community, you know, we're outside of DC, we would really value this, it's important. Um, or if it's from, you know, local elected officials, mayors, you know, town council members, people who can say, yeah, I have a responsibility to this community and I want you to do this to fight back against, you know, what we inevitably know will be a big fight with a lot of money behind it from the opposition. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I want to thank you, Laura, for, for a great discussion. Uh, and I want to thank everyone as well uh, for inviting me to moderate this discussion. This is a very different change of pace for me in a, in a great way to see the types of work that all of you are doing for advocacy and air, air quality. Um, it's, it's really interesting stuff. It's really great work. And I appreciate the opportunity to participate about in it and learn about it. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Really grateful to get to be here with you. Take care.